Any of us acting on our own and in possession of Jesus' powers would have hurried to our sick friend's side and raised him from his sickbed. In this case, however, we would have been doing the wrong thing. Fortunately, Jesus was more self-disciplined under his Father's authority than most of us would be when an urgent need suggests an obvious response. Healing is not always the best outcome of sickness. God may have a better idea. Even Paul, as a miracle-working apostle, could not heal whomever he wished, apart from the specific will of God. He couldn't heal his ministry partner, Trophimus, and had to leave him sick in Miletus. Another partner, Epaphroditus, almost died in Paul's presence, causing him great consternation. Even though the man recovered, there is no evidence that it was through Paul's or anyone else's exercise of a gift of healing. Paul describes it as if it was an unpredictable and seemingly natural recovery. Paul referred to this as a particular act of mercy on God's part, not a predictable, miraculous manifestation of God's universal policies, as some think. Even Paul's loyal protege Timothy had chronic amoebic dysentery, from which none of his Christian friends, including Paul, could bring relief. Instead, Paul gave medical advice. Use a little wine. Most telling of all is the case of Paul's own sickness. Faith healers like to deny that Paul's thorn in the flesh was an organic illness. They suggest he was complaining about persecution from some particularly malicious human foe. While the scriptural support for this theory seems entirely lacking, in the passage itself Paul refers to his problem as an infirmity, the most common word for sickness in the Greek New Testament. It is the same word Paul used in speaking of Timothy's stomach issues. Paul was sick, which he affirmed unambiguously in his letter to the Galatians. You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first. The point of greatest interest is that in the torments of his illness, Paul prayed desperately that Christ would heal him. As in the case of Lazarus' illness, so in Paul's case, Jesus had a better idea. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Upon receiving this revelation, Paul accepted and even rejoiced in his illness, rather than continuing to pursue healing. Whoever says that it is always God's will to heal would have to argue with Jesus and Paul on that score. But, some argue, the coming of the kingdom is supposed to result in God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. There is no sickness in heaven, therefore we should not accept it as a norm on earth either. Yes, but we also know that there is no death in heaven, nor is the devil there. Yet we will never in this life be physically immortal or be free from temptations. We have every right to be praying that conditions like those of heaven, liberation from all sickness, temptations, pain, and death, will come upon earth, but we are specifically informed that those times will come in the new earth after Jesus returns. The final state of perfection must await its proper time, at the end. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. It seems that the related enemies of Satan and sickness will be absolutely eliminated at that time. In the meantime, affliction plays an important role in our spiritual improvement and growth. In the name of Jesus. All Christians have read or heard that we are to pray in the name of Jesus. Fewer know that everything else we do is also to be done in the name of Jesus. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Early Christians healed and cast out demons in the name of Jesus. What does this phrase mean? When one acts in the name of another person, he or she is acting as an authorized agent or trustee. This involves exercising that person's authority in their stead, as when one authorizes a trusted broker to manage one's investments or grants someone power of attorney to sign documents. The agent must act in the interest of the principal, that is, the person who naturally possesses and who has delegated authority to that agent. This is the nature of Jesus' ministry on earth. He came as God's authorized agent to conduct the business of his Father. The works that I do in my Father's name. I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus acted in his Father's name, in and under the authority of his Father and he authorizes us to act likewise in his own name and under his authority. He is the supreme ruler, 
but he has delegated the management of his affairs on earth to his trusted servants. No matter what we do, at any moment of any day, we should see ourselves as Jesus' authorized agents in this world. The words we speak, the prayers we pray, the purchases we make, the friends we choose, the careers we pursue, the conversations in which we engage, the things we post online, all are done strictly because we believe that God wants this action done or needs us as agents in such a circumstance. A Christian may work at the same job alongside unbelievers, but the believer is there for an additional reason. Everyone else may be there only to make a living. The disciple of Jesus is also making a living, but more importantly, he or she is acting in Christ's name and in his stead, penetrating the environment as an agent representing his interests. The Christian bears the name of Jesus before the world, whether knowingly or not. There may be days in which we would not prefer to represent Jesus among unbelievers, or even among other believers. But doing so is not optional. It is the commission of the king. Jesus has risked the fortunes of his kingdom's work, his reputation, and his credibility by placing them all in our hands. The success of his mission depends, to a large extent, upon the faithfulness of those bearing his name. This puts us in the vulnerable position of possibly taking his name in vain, that is, possessing his name and authority, but misrepresenting him and his interests. We are as much under orders to faithfully carry out his enterprise on his behalf as he was to carry out his father's. This calls for us to take our commission more seriously than many Christians have ever considered doing. The bottom line. The bottom line is that Jesus is on the top rung above all. All things are officially subject to him, and the rebellion of all people currently resisting his authority cannot diminish his rank nor compromise his status. It is God, not men, who has given him a name above all names. All will be brought under his feet in due time. We are among those who are privileged to recognize, prior to many others, Christ's position and our need to bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This simplifies so many things. Whenever the question arises, what should I do or say? The answer is always the same as that which Mary told the servants at the wedding. Whatever he says to you, do it.